All right, we're back, and we are going to continue this 30-hour post-licensing course. We are in the fourth lesson, and I had a couple questions on break about that math. Uh, I would suggest you go back and go ahead and try that math a little bit more. The key to that whole math issue is, remember this pile of money is some value. The key is whatever we get, the, the client would get the balance, all right? So whatever you charge as the listing agreement, the key is this portion here, not really this portion. This portion of the uh, commission only dictates, wish I could get that, but this, this portion of the commission only dictates what they're going to get. And that literally, you can just then add up all the numbers. Remember, we added up and got that number. I mean, if there were more things, you could literally just keep, oh, I want to pay a $5,000 credit card off, and I want to pay my $10,000 car off, and I want to pay, buy a football team. I don't even know if a billion can buy a football team. And you can add those numbers up and get some value. I don't know what that's even going to come close to being. One billion, one hundred and sixteen thousand five hundred dollars, and literally do the math. Divide by point four nine four. Divide by point nine four, and that'll give you the, a, a number. The key is: is that number realistic? So we can play this game all day. Just make sure and understand it's got to be a re realistic number. The house is going to have to appraise for that too, okay? So, the terms of the listing agreement. This is going to set forth the contract between the seller and the agent, which would be me, not you. It's the managing broker. The managing broker would be one of the parties, and then all of the sellers, including the husband and wife, or concurrent owners, or the trust, or whoever. The price is going to be the listing price. That's something else that you guys are going to work with. The length of the contract is always something that's in question. I'm going to tell you now, this length can typically be any number you want it to be. And when I say you want it to be, this could be dictated by your managing broker. He may say, I want all my contracts to be six months. I might take a three-month contract. I remember in 2009 and 2010, when the market was a little slower, we signed a couple of one year length listing contracts. So it can be either of those contracts that you want or whatever length is decided upon mutually by your seller and you. There have been people before that have said, I want a 30 day or a three month because I just really want to test the water. Once again, it's up to you to either not take the listing or kind of agree what they want because that is your obligation. Buyer's assistance. Is your seller going to offer up any buyer's assistance? I know during the COVID issue, there was a, a raise in HUD's minimum FICO score to 680 and the cost to get a loan got to be so expensive that there were a lot of buyers that were asking sellers to help them buy the property. And then all of a sudden you started seeing a lot of sellers just offering up buyer's assistance to try and bring in more of the buyers. So that buyer's assistance may be a question of what market are you in? Then you've got that whole issue of personal property. Is there going to be any personal property that is going to stay with the uh, selling like the washer and dryer or is the pool table staying you could also suggest that there might be things that are going things that should stay that maybe are going to go all of those things have to be captured on your listing agreement so that they can be translated over to the MLS or the BLC so that the buyer coming in 
is going to know that the, hey this property has the washer and dryer staying and you know the ceiling fan is actually going to go away so all that has to be captured so that it can be translated to the listing agreement what are the types of listing agreements that you can use well there are actually three different types of listing agreements now in our blc in our board your board could be if you're in the uh, blc the same one if you're in another board they have these same listings too i am not sure since we all use the same iar contract i will tell you these two right here there's not even a contract for these all right <clears throat> These are more protective the higher they go up. They're more protective of the agent. This is a case of we're going to actually talk about our benefit for once. So the exclusive right to sell grants the agent the right to be the exclusive agent to market the property for sale. When a buyer comes to that seller and they create a deal, the listing agent gains a commission no matter what. <clears throat> the fact that the listing agent got the seller to sign a listing, that in fact makes him the procuring cause, all right? This is obviously gonna be one that you fight a lot of times. Who was the procuring cause? The procuring cause is defined as a result or a series of incidents that ultimately lead to the sale of a property with no broken chain of events. <clears throat> now the question is, what's a broken chain? And we can talk about that when we get on the selling side. Typically with a listing side, there really is no broken chain because the house is listed or it's not. Now there is an exception to that called the buyer's protection clause, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. So the exclusive right to sell allows the seller to sell the property and the listing agent becomes the procuring cause. So therefore he gets paid no matter who brings the buyer. If the agent brings the buyer, he gets paid. If the seller himself brings the buyer, he gets paid. If Santa Claus brings the buyer, he gets paid. This is the big mama Luca. It is the one that we actually have the form for. Now, there are two variations of this down the chain. The next one is called the exclusive agency. Now, the exclusive agency virtually is the same concept, except there is one exemption to who brings the buyer. And that exemption is if the seller himself brings the buyer, then no commission is paid, all right? If the seller himself finds the buyer, then there is no commission paid. So think about this, there actually has to be agency involved with the buyer <clears throat> for this to count. Now, that could be you as the listing agent bring the buyer, there's agency there, or another agent bring the buyer. The exemption here is if the seller's standing on the driveway and some jogger walks by and says, hey, is your house for sale? And the seller says, yeah, I'll sell it to you. And that uh, buyer buys the property under an exclusive agency, there would be no commission paid <clears throat> because the seller himself brought the buyer to the table. This is one that you will often see as a placation with FISBO people. Now, we want them to buy the exclusive right to sell, but let's say they're like, nah, you know, I've been selling bicycles all my life. I really can sell this. You can try the exclusive agency as kind of like a last ditch effort. Okay, Mr. Seller, I'll tell you what I do. How about you let me list the property. If I bring a buyer, you pay me. If you bring a buyer through your bicycle sales activity, then you don't pay me. Okay, I'll try that. Okay, let's sign an exclusive agency. 
like I said before, there's really no form for this. So what ends up happening is you take the exclusive right to sell form and then in the further agreements, you would write something to the effect of if the seller brings the buyer, then no commission will be paid to the modeling group. And that's how you would create that out for the seller is through that little thing that you would write because we don't even actually have a form for that. All right. So now the third one is this thing called an open agency. Open. An open agency is the least protective of the agent. And what this really says is that whoever brings the buyer also gets the listing. So in other words, you end up with limited agency. If you bring the buyer, you get the listing portion. So you end up with the Mimi deal. Everybody else ends up with nothing. But here's the key. In an open agreement, the seller can enter into as many open agencies as he chooses to, as long as the agent takes it as well. So in theory, you could have the REMAX sign beside the Caldwell Banker sign, beside the KW sign, beside the Century 21, beside the Modulin Group, beside your sign, and there'll be six signs in the yard and a buyer jogs by and whichever person he calls off the sign for whatever reason, maybe he liked the color of the sign, maybe your phone number is memorable, maybe he recognized one of the names and he calls and says, hey, I want to be the buyer, that agent would get the listing and the buyer as well. All of the other agents get nothing. That is called open agency. So your question is, why would any agent enter in to open agency? That's a damn good question. So let's talk about it. Could it, is there ever a case when it actually makes sense? Well, when I say that, it makes sense for the seller. It kind of could make sense for you. Here's where it doesn't make sense that most of you are thinking about. That scenario I gave you with the five signs in the front yard, if all of those agents are in the same MLS system, that becomes very difficult because once the first agent puts it in the MLS system, the second agent will try to put it in and it's going to say, sorry, that property is already listed. You can't list it. So only one of them are going to get access to that MLS. At least almost all the MLSs I know. Now you can manipulate that and finagle your way around it if you change tax numbers and get sneaky and tricky. But ultimately, let's talk about the legal process. The legal way is once you put that tax number in, it's going to say this property is already listed. But here's where it does make sense. Suppose there is a property and it's on a lake like Nashville, Indiana, Brown County. Where is that buyer sitting now? Well, it's possible that the buyer is sitting in Indianapolis. It's also possible he's sitting in Spencer, Indiana, or Columbus, Indiana, or maybe it's going to be a weekend retreat for someone out of Fort Wayne. Those all potentially are different MLS systems. <clears throat> so the seller, because the property is sufficiently unique enough that it could draw buyers from all over a huge geographic location, may want it to be, and they may call Bob and go, hey, Bob, we want to enter into an open listing, and you're going to get the Indy MLS. And Sue, you're going to get, you know, the South Indy, South Indiana MLS. And this one's going to get the Lafayette board. Uh, yeah, I can't spell. And this one's going to get the Fort Wayne board. 
So now they all can be entered into different MLS systems because they are different databases. Now, whichever one brings the buyer will get the listing, all right? So there are uh, several cases where potentially that open listing may make sense for the seller. And if you knew that you were the only one in your MLS system that was actually marketing the property, you might take that on and say, okay, I will market it and realize that I've got all of the Indianapolis MLS. So that's a huge group of people. I can probably bring a buyer. All right, so those are the three types of listings. And like I said once before, we actually only have this contract. If you were to want to enter into some of the other two contracts, you are going to have to actually modify the exclusive right to sell contract to account for the seller's exclusion or the fact that you don't get paid if you don't bring the buyer, all right?